Hey folks, welcome back to Fresh Produce. I'm Pete from BTI. Today we've got a super special guest on. I've got Ken Avery from Victoria Tires. He's a tire designer and gonna talk to us about the tires themselves, some of the design processes, and we'll just have a conversation about all things Victoria. So let's dive right into it. Ken, thank you so much for joining us today. Really appreciate you coming on the show. No, I'm glad to be here, man. You know, I, I love talking about tires and uh, you guys are such an important partner with us that I want to make sure you guys have all the information you need and, and uh, we all have fun riding bikes. Sounds great, man. Victoria is super interesting to me because it seems like you really have evolved the line uh, recently, especially, but uh, you know, I think there's some really important history to talk about too. So um, I guess that kind of just leads right into my first question, like coming from this your you, Victoria has been this really top contender in the road race world. Um, can you talk about like how you're expanding more into the dirt side and the efforts there and then how BTI fits into that as well? Absolutely. Um, you know, Victoria has a, a very long history on the road, obviously, you know, I mean, we've been making road tires for uh, about 70 years and um, you know, uh, the results speak for themselves, obviously that our Palmares, you know, everything from the spring classics to the grand tours, all that track cycling, um, all things road. And, you know, a lot of people uh, associate Vittoria with that. Um, and yeah, you're right. In in uh, the last really 10 years, we've made a big push to get into the off-road categories. And I always look at this as a spectrum. So I look at everything from, imagine, you know, the spectrum of cycling disciplines from say track cycling all the way through, you know, road, gravel, cross country, enduro into downhill and all that. And, and um, we've really been marching in this direction to expand into these off-road categories. Uh, and, you know, uh, in doing so, we've taken the, the quality control and the super high-end materials and, and all of this technology that has really made us in road and applied that into these other categories. And, um, and quickly we've had some results. Um, so, you know, just this year, in fact, um, you know, uh, the, the, the Victoria family has won everything from track cycling world championships to, to the tour de France, to both gravel titles and now into cross country mountain bike world championships this year alone. Cool. Yeah. What a, what a, what a big March. And like, there's such a wide spectrum, like you said in there. So that is a, a great point. Um, can you talk about kind of how you brought some of those technologies that created these really winning t uh, road tires and like are applying that into mountain or does it not apply? I guess. Oh, it absolutely does. Yeah. I mean, so, you know, in road cycling, the surface is pretty controlled, um, in traditional roads. I mean, yeah, sure. Like you have some rough roads. I live in New Hampshire. We have plenty of rough roads, but yeah. at the same time, I mean, um, you know, you're talking about like a, a pretty controlled paved surface, you know, a track, is obviously a track cycling uh, tire is going to be like a, a you know yeah. groomed wooden track, very smooth, right? So, um, in order to be able to make a tire faster in such a controlled surface, on a controlled surface, um, you know, it's really a hard thing to do. And 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 Victoria has done this by using different materials. I mean, we make nylon tires, we make cotton tires. Uh, we have a couple different processes for, for both. We have, a you know, the, the only forehead extruder for compound manufacturing uh, in bicycle tires in the world. Uh, so there's a lot of things like that in terms of the company. But my the reason I start here is because if we can make a tire optimized for such a simple surface, when you have then the variance in off-road surfaces, um, it actually makes even more of a difference there. Um, if you can imagine that. So, um, yeah, just the reason just, I say that is because, you know, you're, you're trying to conquer, um, a lot of different situations. And so, um, you know, if you can, if you can do it on something that's so simple, uh, the opportunities are vast once you get into these other kind of situations. Yeah. Just to dive deeper into something you mentioned that four head extruder, that means you can put like four different compounds into the same tire. Right. And I think a lot of the, a lot of the competitors just have two or three, so, and in my mind, like that totally applies to mountains so well, you can do these softer compounds on the corner knobs where you really need it so much and still give support underneath. seems like a really cool opportunity. And yeah, yeah you know, and, and it is, and you know, a lot of people say, well, why wouldn't you just use a soft compound everywhere? Right. Or something like that. Um, and, um, you know, it's not quite as simple as that. It's yeah. if you step back and say, you make your tire choice based on the terrain you're trying to conquer. Um, you then have to kind of take as a tire designer, 
uh, or in, in any kind of product development, you have to take like a holistic approach to the entire situation because oftentimes one variable will sort of cannibalize another, right? So yeah. you can make this tire really soft, but then it wears out quickly, or you can make the tire grippy, but then it rolls slow um, or it's heavier. You know, there's, there's a lot of different things. And so being able to have that forehead extruder is, is a big deal for us because it allows us to place compounds exactly where we need to on the tread. And it's not just in a single layer, it's actually in a multi-layer process. Yeah, so you can actually stack compounds on top of each other, right? Correct. So what you can do is you can imagine like a, a very aggressive mountain bike tire that has like a really tall uh, like side knob on it, right? Um, you want that to be gummy, but you want it to be stable. Yeah, if it flexes too much, you're not going to get anything out of it. It's going to just fold over and not hold you when you're really pushing on it. So. Yeah, I mean, you see, you know, in some tires in the market, you see the knobs rip right off, right? And, Absolutely. And you, you don't see that on a Victoria tire. Um, it, it's stable. The base is stable, but the the upper portion of the knob is is really compliant and can really grip to whatever root or rock you're trying to grab onto. Um, and you can tune that so that the tire actually rolls faster. And that's where we've seen really in gravel, um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, like, you know, this, this year was the first UCI gravel world championships and we won both the pro men and the pro women's class, um, you know, with the Terreno dry that day. Um, and, um, you know, a tire like that has a very complex tread design, but it also has very complex, uh, compound technology. And that's, and that's really something that set Vittori apart. Yeah, it makes such a difference in that gravel world where, you know, rolling resistance is so important, but also durability and all these other factors, too. Yeah, cool. So, yeah, gravel is really where, you know, the, the speed question of road intersects with that durability and as well as with traction. Right. So, um, you know, just just being fast alone on a on a in a lab somewhere doesn't really matter when you're on the side of the road trying to, you know, deal with a flat tire or something um, exactly and, that's the uh, fastest ways to lose a race exactly right? <laughs> yeah. De dependability is really where where that all comes you know into play absolutely um hey so speaking about all these different compounds and so many things going into a tire can you talk us through the process of like designing a tire all the way to like making a final tire because it just seems to me like you can't make a whole bunch of prototypes the molds aren't, you know, they're way too expensive to do. Tell me about it. Yeah, I have no idea. Yeah, where to start yeah I mean, gosh, <laughs> like how much time do you have? <laughs> I, uh, it's 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 a huge process. Um, you know, what it really comes down to uh, is, you know, I, I've been I've been designing tires for over twenty years in the bike industry, and and I love this because it it, it it inherently at the root of it, you're you're trying to solve a problem for real riders, right? It's not like, hey, how do we make a widget? It's, it's literally, I want to make something better so that somebody has a better ride or they can increase their performance. And ultimately, if they're, if they're, if they happen to be a racer, like that helps them there. But honestly, like if you're just trying to get to work and you're a city commuter, you know, like the word Vittoria actually means victory in Italian. A lot of people don't realize that. And um, it's not just about racing though. I mean, if, if you get to work in a dependable way, that's a win on that level. That and, is, yeah. and so it, it's a matter of like, whatever your personal win is, uh, we're trying to provide a solution for that. So as a product designer, we think in those terms. Um, and so I was actually designing product all day yesterday and late at night, in fact. And so this is a timely question. Um, you first start with, um, you know, where is there, you know, uh, uh, some sort of like a commercial market opportunity, right? You say, okay, like we yeah. need to solve this problem in this cycling discipline in this segment, right? That's what I was thinking. A kind of a problem to solve would be a place to start, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, like we need to make, um, well, like for instance, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna go with that that Terreno mountain, uh, Terreno gravel tire, rather. Um, yeah. So um, the Terreno dry is an example. So. Um, that's amazing that you happen to have one right there. Oh, I'm that, prepared, yeah. I did not know that. That's that's amazing. <laughs> so, um, so think about this. This is a tire that is meant for fast, uh, drier conditions in gravel, which means you're going to be riding on pavement as well as hard packed dirt. So, you know, you want to have something that is a low profile tread that's going to be highly flexible. Um, 
And, you know, so how do you then make a tire roll fast, but then still have braking traction? You see a lot of tires in this segment that are what are known as, say, a file tread, totally. right? A, a traditional file tread in gravel has these micro diamonds, right? Yeah, little points right throughout. Yeah, right in the middle. And, and, and those micro diamonds, they're like a millimeter big or like less. They're symmetrical. The leading edge and the trailing edge, they're symmetrical. So in other words, any benefit that you get in rolling actually is a detriment in, say, braking or cornering when you're when you're sort of in that upright lean angle position. Check this out. Put your finger on the Terrano dry in the All middle, right? right? Yeah. Push down really hard okay. and run your finger backwards on the tread and then run your fingers forward on the tread. Okay, so backwards and forwards. It feels significantly different, really. Like pushing it this way, I can really feel the grab on my finger, yeah. Yeah, this uses a fish scale tread pattern. So in other words, when it rolls forward, it's almost like a slick. You can ride these on rollers and they're silent. Wow. But when you when you apply a braking force or a cornering, like kind of upward and outward in, in the yeah. direction of the cornering force, um, all those, like there's like thousands of micro effective edges that dig in. So this is an asymmetrical flex, asymmetrical, you know, rolling um, that, that basically allows this grip to be provided in a practical way to solve that problem. Cool. And then the other thing that you see typically with file treads, as an example, just going with this one, is you typically see this micro diamond knurling in the middle and then like big side knobs. Yeah. Um, and the crazy thing with that is that it feels like unstable and loose in the center tread. And then when you're on pavement, you have these side knobs that feel weird on pavement. Flex and don't, yeah. Totally, right? It feels yeah. strange. So with the Torino Dry, what we did was we put an intermediate knob. You'll see there's a knob between the center and the side that's right. half the height half the height difference between the center and the side. So it's like a staircase. So it, it it climbs up to your side knob in a progressive way. When you're on pavement, it feels totally normal and natural. It doesn't feel sketchy in that like, you know, side knob way that you'd feel like on a mountain bike tire on pavement maybe. Yeah. Um, but when you're on grass or like mixed conditions, it digs in like a normal side knob would. Cool. We'll put in some uh, really detailed shots of this because I think it's it's worthwhile to show the detail on that. But, you know, the center kind of just looks like little squares that do look pretty symmetrical. But really pushing my finger across it highlighted just how different those are front to back. And then it's easy to see those uh, half side, step side knob on the side as well or intermediary knob. Pretty cool. And I also noticed I didn't grab one today, but I noticed that the smaller uh, width tire is pretty different. Like the knob, the center knobs look closer together. It looks even smoother than this 47 C. So it seems like each size is designed slightly different, right? Correct. Yeah. We don't simply just stretch it and scale it up in a sort of linear way. Um, each size is going to be optimized for the use. So like, say if you have, you know, that, that exact terrain dry tire, if you have that in say a 30, you know, 33, say the cyclocross size, right. Yeah. Um, it's going to be optimized for that. Now, if you, if you get that tire and like the, you know, more of the gravel end of things, like say a 40, um, it's, it's, it is going to be a little different because you're, you're dealing with capabilities and intended use that are going to be different in that way. And then we make, we make that tire all the way up in mountain bike sizes. That's, that's like a world cup short track favorite of, uh, you know, like the, the Santa Cruz rock shocks team. Um, you know, they, they use that short track constantly because it just rolls so fast and it still is dependable yeah. for that kind of a use. The those other guys are, thing that people use that tire for is bike packing. Totally. Totally. You yeah. want a fast rolling tire that's dependable, that still has capability, you know, like that, that's a, that's a great option for that. Just works on a ton of surfaces that you're likely to see bike packing and who knows what you're going to roll across this whole, this will work. Yeah. Yeah. Made me think that short track, like they're oftentimes starting and finishing on hard pack. So it's got to work there too, or excuse me, on, on full on pavement. Uh, uh, so that's, yeah, yeah. it makes but, sense. You know, inevitably there's like that gravel that comes like on the pavement where the transition is. Right. And and this is also that this tire can also deal with that as well. And, and, yeah. and I don't mean to harp on the Torino dry so much, but this is just one example. And it's, it's a great example of trying to design a product to solve a problem in an outside the box thinking way, right? Nobody had yeah. done that fish scale approach before. Um, and then, you know, we won the first two gravel world championships with it, you know, right out of the box. So pretty cool. Cool. So, so you're sitting at home, uh, designing this tire late at night. And then like, what are the steps after that? That's kind of what I was, you know, originally getting at it. 
this it blows my mind how it goes from a drawing to a, a finished product. Yeah, I mean our 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 um our innovation center in uh, in Italy, in northern Italy. Um, you know, we have we have this huge bike park we just built. Um, and, and we also have our, our production uh, facility in uh, Thailand. And, you know, um, in Thailand, there's there's a lot of rubber trees. And so there's a lot of, uh, you know, uh, we have a, a deep history producing tires there of the highest quality. Um, but the reason I mentioned those two facilities um, is because basically what we'll do is the first thing we'll usually do uh, is make a 3D print. And in fact, here cool. is... Here is a 3D print of the Torino Dry. Sweet. So that's like a rigid, hard material. Yeah, this is a this is plastic. Yeah. Uh, you can 3D print in rubber, but I never do that because I don't want people to get, think it's actually a rubber compound <laughs> or like a real tire. Right. So I, I usually produce these little samples in plastic. Um, and then what we do is, you know, you can snap this onto a rim and you can take kind of dimensions off it and just make sure the proportions are exactly what we want. Um, and once once we've made a few of these and passed them around to our our pro teams, and you know we do talk to you know some 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 commercial partners as well, and and you know we get a lot of opinions. What we don't want to do is is design inside of a bubble. Um, yeah. There's a lot of companies um, you know that are they're just trying to get something to market, right? And 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 in doing so, they they actually do a disservice to themselves in a way because they'll just they'll push something out and and then the first time someone rides it it's kind of like a I hope you like it kind of <laughs> scenario right <laughs> our 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 process is really proven in this way because yeah. we don't do that what we do is yeah. you know we it's a collaborative effort to say okay like what does an athlete need um we have a lot of pro teams that we deal with um uh you know world tour road teams to to world cup mountain bike teams every, and everything in between and uh, all the federations and all that stuff in the Olympic years. So we get their feedback on, on how we can make something better to solve their problem. And then we talk to, uh, you know, partners like yourself to say, hey, you know, are you getting requests for something like this? Like, is this yeah. a problem that we can solve for you guys? And then, um, you know, once we do that and we do some sort of initial tread design, we make some of these samples, uh, these 3D prints. We kind of show that around a little bit. And when everybody says, yeah, that's I think that's that's a really good thing we'll make um, some prototypes. And then oftentimes those prototypes, um, if they if they pass muster on the initial testing, um, you know, cause we have a, a major testing facility in Thailand that has a lot of really proprietary machines uh, that were made specifically just for us for these tests um, to validate things like, you know, rolling resistance and, and puncture resistance and, and grip and, and wet weather grip and cold weather grip and all sorts of things like this. Once we get past that and we hand them out to our test team, we have a, a roster of testers globally that includes, again, you know, world tour athletes, as well as some just enthusiasts. Yeah. And, and this is actually something that's actually really critical that I really want you guys to know about as well. It's one thing to give the best riders in the world product. They're going to be fast on anything. Absolutely. And, and that's great to validate the product at the high end. But I would actually argue that our testers who um, are kind of just normal enthusiasts are actually equally, if not more important, because they represent, you know, people who you guys do business with, for instance, like all the people that, that you guys help uh, in your business uh, also need to be, you know, benefiting from this technology. So uh, we do have roster of people um, sort of like that to also validate this. Uh, and once it goes through a test cycle, we then, you know, have a launch path. And um, oftentimes along that launch path, we'll win some major races. <laughs> you know, it's it's really crazy. That's always the um, goal, right? <laughs> I mean, like I, I can tell you right now, like in, in 2015, we won world cross country championships on the, on the Barzo. Um, I'm standing at Interbike like two weeks after you know, that, that race. And it was like, what just happened? We're like launching this product right now. And it already won world championships. Like, uh, how was. yeah, what a great talking point to have right off the bat. <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's a really fun process. And, and when, when you do it in this way, um, it's already validated before you launch it. It's not, it's not a hope you like it scenario. It's a, we know this works at the highest level and you're going to be psyched. Yeah. Cool. 
Sounds really cool. I love hearing the uh, the 3D printing and really seeing how the proportions, that makes a ton of sense to me. And um, yeah, awesome. Cool. So hearing about all that process, I also want to get into something that's really unique with Vittoria. You know, all over the packaging, there's the call out of the chemical, I guess, additives to the, to the rubber. So on this one, graphene 2.0, on um, this course and next, we've got both graphene and um, silica mixed in there. So talk to me about like how that's different from your competitors and also like where that conversation belongs in selling this tire if we're a shop guy or just even understanding how it fits in if we're a consumer. Yeah, so um, that's a, it's a complex one. Um, yeah. And you know, uh, like for instance, that first one, graphene 2.0, that's been an evolution of our, our use in graphene, right? So um, I remember being at, at Eurobike when we were first launching graphene of the world and it was like the night before and it was like, wow, oof, it was like a, a daunting thing to try to describe this, this substance, right? And so yeah. basically um, graphene, you know, on a, on a basic level is, is it's so thin that it's basically the only two dimensional substance that, that, you know, is recognized in this way. Right. But at the same time, it has a massive effect on, on strength and just elasticity and, and, uh, heat dissipation and all of these things. And that's fine. That's all <laughs> like this, like super heavy tech stuff. Yeah. But as we talked about before, at the end of the day, all that matters is, does it provide a benefit? Does it That's solve it. a problem? Um, you know, uh, when we first came out with graphene, some of our competitors were like, oh, that's marketing. Oh, you know, that's it's it's big tech stuff that, well, you know, whatever. And my, my reply to that has always been, listen, we tell you what we put in our tires. You can Google it. You know, like none of the competitors do that. They come up with kitschy yeah. names that that are that truly are marketing. And, and that's fine. I mean, everybody has great technology and I'm not I'm not speaking poorly of our competitors in this way. But the one thing that truly sets Victoria apart is you literally can research what graphene is. Um, and, you yeah. know, I mean, brands like, say, Oakley, they made apparel with graphene in, in the clothing to, to, to promote heat dissipation. Yeah, I was going to say it's used in a bunch of different industries for sure. So it's not just, you know, your own. Yeah. Yeah. Um, tennis rackets uh, that are carbon. So in, in carbon, sometimes it's used in the resin and, and things like this. But in tires, um, you know, we found that it had a dramatic effect on the rubber. So um, there's always been this, this give and take, as I mentioned earlier in this conversation with, you know, one factor can, can really affect another. And when you're trying to optimize things and, and, you know, product in general has gotten so good, no matter who you get it from, that, you know, on some way, it's like really hard to do something different to, yeah. to make this, this gain. Um, and, and so graphene was one way that we could put that across our entire line. I mean, we make road race tires, road training tires, mountain bike, gravel, city tires, everything with graphene. Um, and so, um, you know, it's something that's really been a, a, a big, you know, story for us and, and technology for us, but graphene 2.0 was an evolution in that. So that was where we were able to really functionalize the use of graphene to really then apply it to a specific, you know, so like in road tires, you know, you're going to have, um, speed grip durability, right? Um, and that that sort of graph is going to look different than the speed grip durability needs of somebody racing enduro, right? Okay. So um, and so we're able to kind of like vary the graphene effect on on those cases for that purpose, if that makes sense. Right. Um, and the new tire that you see uh, also uses silica, and that's something that's like a another way to kind of manipulate that compound to provide uh, vastly more uh, wet weather grip. Uh, it also has an effect on rolling resistance as well in a positive way. And, um, you know, you'll see, you'll see more of that um, in the future. So this is always an evolution. Um, Vittoria is never going to sit idle and, and say that we're done. It's, it's always, we're always hungry to make tires better and tire systems better, which is why also, you know, things like liners come into play and, and different, different applications like that. Yeah. All right. What a transition. Let's talk about tire liners. You know, I'm more from the mountain bike side. Uh, you know, I've been running Kushkor for a long time and a variety of other things. But I think Victoria, Victoria is so interesting that you have different liners for different uses all the way to a full on road race application. So uh, I guess to start out with, I'd love to hear about how are you designing tires with liner use in mind already? Has that changed the like the casings or other 
design applications? Liners um, have changed everything. Yeah. Um, and, um, you know, the, the tires that we make are, of course, compatible with, uh, I mean, if it's tubeless ready, well, I mean, it has to still be com to be inner tube yeah. compatible. It you know, has to be tubeless compatible. And now and we consider liner use now as well, right? So, um, you know, if you, if you think about, you know, liners and how they came to be, especially as a mountain bike, I'm a mountain bike guy too, I get it. Um, and, um, you know, liners came to be in the gravity, you know, segments first, right? It was like an impact thing. Like, I don't want to flat, I don't want to, you know, when, when people stopped using thick downhill inner tubes and they started really embracing tubeless in the gravity segments, um, that was great for a lot of reasons, but at the same time, people were then pinching through their tire. Absolutely. And so, you know, they were using uh, liner systems to kind of avoid that. But we found that like liner systems have like a lot of different benefits. Exactly. So, um, and much as tires differ from category to category, so do the liners, at least on the Victoria line they do. And, 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 you know, I mean, if the intended use is going to be different, then we should really take a, a specialized, direct, unique approach on how to solve that problem for that rider. And, and that's something that we believe in across our line. And that's the reason that our liners look a little different from, from category to category. Um, you know, as an example, on the mountain bike liner, you'll see a shape that is going to be optimized to um, not only, you know, help with, with impact resistance, but it's also going to give you uh, a bead lock effect and, and, you know, help prevent burping and things like that. Uh, we have athletes on the uh, Enduro World Series who, you know, were using these who completely destroyed their wheel. Um, you know, the spokes are poking through and they're, they're, yeah. they had a huge flat spot and, and the tires still stayed on. Um, yeah. And they were able to get through their stage. Um, you know, um, one of our athletes, you know, they, they were doing the South American uh, round and, and um, they pedaled for, you know, two minutes on, on this D-shaped wheel. And it enabled them to like get through the event in this way. And, and otherwise it would have been a throwout, you know? And, and so um, that's great. But the, the bigger, I think, benefit, um, especially in the off-road categories is actually um, the ability to run a lower pressure, yeah. which then affects your contact patch and your suppleness. So it right. increases comfort, right? If you're doing a, a say gravel, right? Uh, we have a gravel liner. If you're doing a hundred mile gravel race, you're getting beat up for a hundred totally. miles. Yep. Um, being able to run a lower pressure is an advantage because you as a rider, you're not going to get beat up. Number one, number two, you're going to have better traction. Um, number three, I would actually argue that if you have something sharp, that's going to press against the tire to puncture it. And the tire has the ability to flex away from that sharp object. You'll actually get fewer flats that way. In totally. addition to getting fewer flats from say an impact. Um, so, you know, if you go to like unbound gravel, like super sharp, I was just going to say, yeah, applies directly to that sharp flint stones, right? Oh, it's so, it's so bad yeah. as, a, as a product designer, you know, you see all these horror stories and you're trying to just provide a solution. And, and so the road has a natural curve to it, this crown and all the debris gets pushed over to the side. So you'll be humming along in the center. And then, you know, somebody will say, Hey, on your left and you'll, you'll do the polite thing and you pull over a little bit. And then you get into the sharp stuff and you flat, ah, yeah, right. that's the worst ever. Right. So we want to make sure that we provide solutions to help uh, against that. So, I mean, of course the tire construction and compound and the cut resistance of the graphene compound is excellent. And the 4C layering, you know, having the, the firmer base on the 4C also provides puncture protection in addition to how the tire uh, tread flex is. But all of that as a system, then working with the liner also provides your ability to run a lower pressure. You know, again, if a sharp object pushes, the, the tread can flex away. Yep. If you have an impact, the liner prevents your rim from bottoming out. Again, this is where it all comes back to designing as a system. Totally. So do you feel like people should or could run uh, like uh, lighter casing tires when they're using a, uh, a liner? And that's kind of what I made me think about this, you know, is should everybody be running, you know, lighter casing tires if they're running a liner or is obviously this is a question that I get from case. time to time. And, and it, my, my, my answer is always um, in certain cases you can. Yeah. Now a lighter casing tire is going to have less abrasion resistance. So if you're say on a, a cross country bike and you're running our XC race casing, which is the tan casing, yeah. that's a single ply 120. Um, 
Now, from an impact standpoint, you still have that 4C compound. So in the tread area, you have puncture protection. Um, and, and if you're running that liner, you'll have an impact protection from the rim. However, what you don't have then is that sidewall abrasion. So if you're riding, uh, say, New England, and you have like sharp rocks that you're scuffing up against as you yeah. roll by them, well, that's something that you may want to consider riding that XC trail casing, which has the sidewall protection. Okay. But if you're riding in an area, say, where it's hard pack and then you have some edges, um, but you don't have that like a, abrasive kind of rock or something like that, you absolutely can run a, a lighter casing because you're not worried about the impact pinching through that light casing yeah. because you have that liner to protect you. Yeah. So it's a case by case basis. Um, but it does enable you to run lower pressure and you, and in, in many, in many ways you can get away with a lighter casing for sure. Yeah. That's a really important to point out all these different pro, you know, important things to take into account when you're making that decision. So cool. Thanks for that. Hey Ken, we've covered so much already and we still have a lot to talk about. So let's cut this into two episodes and we'll have a lot of content for our viewers to watch. Thanks again. And we'll see you on the next one. Folks, make sure you check out our next episode for more discussion with Ken from Vittoria Tires. <laughs>